Community gardening is really a true move of patriotism, and sustainability is a, is, is a patriotic movement. Community gardens have been way back to the days of victory gardens before World War II. We did things to make America strong, and that's one thing. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Here we are in a beautiful backyard garden in Ashland, Oregon. Not everybody's got a backyard to do gardens as we localize to produce more of our food right where we live. I'm here with my guest, Patrick Marcus. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. You're helping um, enlarge the possibilities for people gardening who don't have backyard gardens. Tell us what you're doing, it's interesting. Well, right now I'm the uh, volunteer garden manager for the Ashland Community Garden, which is part of the Ashland Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, and that's a community garden site here in the lower part of Ashland that has 44 plots. And we have... In one, in one site, 44 it's, it's plots? It's one spot, right. It's, uh, and it's, it's on a piece of property that the park department is currently developing a master plan for. Okay. And, uh, how did you manage to get into, or, I mean, are, were you part of Parks and Recreation? Or how did you manage to get this to happen? Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting story. I'm, I'm not the, the garden originator. One of my friends, a woman named Carol Kale, uh, <laughs> no. oh, okay, right, okay. Who, who, who lived in a condominium project across the creek from this old dairy land, it's about seven acres, uh, noticed that the Parks Department had purchased this land for a future park site. It, there was a pasture and some paddocks and just basically some prairie land that bordered the creek. And she approached the uh, Parks Department along with another master gardener friend of hers named Carol Carlson. They went before the planning of the Parks Commission and said, look at folks, you've got this big piece of land, you're not going to do anything with it. Can we put a temporary community garden on this property? Uh -huh. About that time I got involved and, and helped them put some infrastructure behind it and we plowed the land, the Parks Department put up deer fencing and irrigation and then uh, the Parks Department manages the property in the sense that if somebody wants to become a garden member, they call the North Mountain Parks uh, Nature okay. Center, get on the wait list, and sign the contract, pay the fee, and then we manage it for them. So you, you as, a vol as volunteers? Yeah, essentially. So how long has this been in operation? This is our fourth season. Okay. And what's what's happened in what has it evolved or what did it take for them? I mean, did you have to go to the city council or just parks just said that's fine and or what's going to happen? I mean, tell me more. Well, it, when we got the okay to go ahead with the community garden on that piece of property, um, it was strictly a temporary arrangement. Okay. And uh, like probably hundreds of gardens across the country, it's one of the things that, that we fight is, is, our, is our permanence, whether or not we can stay. Mm. And, and every garden across the country has some degree of that. Not every, but 99% of, of the community do, gardens. Of the community sure, gardens. Because sure. most of them are not located on park properties. Um, so our, uh, we had a, a very peaceful, happy place to garden for that two, three year period. Then the word came down the pike that the park said, well, we're going to develop this property now. We're going to change it into a city park. Uh, Ashland has a wonderful goal of having a park, a city park, within a quarter mile walking distance of every resident of Ashland. Oh, that is a fabulous, Fantastic. fabulous plan. And, oh. and they're not all huge grand parks. Many of them are small little pocket parks. There's a park around the corner here that has a bocce ball court and a, and a horseshoe court and maybe a, a swing set. Uh, there's gardens that have water play areas and big places for people to you know hang out in the sun nice. and picnic and and our site was the um, only site on city property that was had any kind of community garden space on it or a place there where the land was being used to produce food essentially and um, when the city said well we're going to do a master plan for this and we're really not sure we want to have a community garden here we we think we really want to make it more of a natural preserve uh, with the riparian zones and things like that. And it's all very good, good stuff. Um, 
But the gardeners who had invested a fair amount of time there said, you know, you guys are missing a boat here. This, this is a very popular amenity. And so um, we started getting active in the community and attending the uh, various uh, park commission meetings because each city structured a little differently. Okay. And so uh, we advocated for a community garden to stay on that site. And that was only half the battle though because like many city infrastructures, they need policies and procedures to work. Guidelines for future development, right? Right, and, okay. and so the, the argument wasn't whether or not our community garden needed to be on this property and in, in, on this future garden site, our park site, but whether or not the city was going to accept a community garden model as part of their infrastructure in the park system. So they would include, so they've got recreation and walking spaces, a garden is a different kind of critter here. It's very much a different kind of critter, and it took a lot of education. Um, I must say that you know that uh, we have five parks commissioners, and, and most of them were in favor of. It. In fact, all of them were in favor of it. They all had different visions of what uh. the park should be, though, and so it took some education. And probably one of the things that was very helpful was to bring to the attention of what leisure time activity is because that's their goal is to provide leisure time oh, okay. activity okay. you know okay. opportunities for for people to recreate okay and um, when I started getting into the to the research what we found was is that gardening in general is like the either the number one or number two leisure time activity in America really and it vacillates Whoa. between fishing <laughs> Wow, both outdoor activities. Both, well, it, well, the I mean, number one way, is, guess what the number one is? Watching television. Yeah, watching television. Okay. Yeah, uh, and, and computer yeah, games. And those are all very right up there as like the number one. Uh, but as far as outdoor leisure activities, gardening in general is the number one or number two. And this is, not, uh, this is data put out by the, by the Harris Poll Group. And it's been this way for several years. And fishing and gardening vacillate back and forth. And, and since you can't fish in the Ashland Creek because it's, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a protected habitat zone for salmon spawning and stuff. So that was kind of out of the question there as, the, as being an activity. You could, so they had to reframe their thinking then right. as gardening as recreation, which fits then in their province right. and, and their mission. Right. And it, it's not to say that it's, it's preferred over things, for instance, like sport activities field activities, baseball or soccer or things like that. Because um, people who garden also like those activities as well. And g people who play you know, sports activities like the garden. And, um, and, but the other educational component that was very important was getting them to acknowledge that in a, in a tight urban environment where we have restrictions on our urban growth boundaries and we're being forced to develop more internal to town that spaces like this beautiful garden are getting rarer and mm. rarer for a lot mm. of the citizens of this town because they're putting higher density housing on these properties and unless you provide an opportunity for people to escape into that particular leisure time activity there is no place for people to garden they're going to get all swallowed up by oh, the sure. development absolutely and in our in our little community um, we have 20,000 people here in Ashland in, in, a, in a very uh, defined urban growth boundary and our town is not going to grow over the, you know, outwards. Yes, yes. So we're going to grow up. And if the park goal is to put uh, a park within a quarter mile distance of, of everything, then they need to take that into consideration. So there was a, a bunch of things around the notion of educating them around leisure time activity. Um, but getting back to it, another point was they had to recognize that community gardening is not just leisure time activity, it's community building. Oh, how so? Well, the word, let's start with the word community, <laughs> right there. Um, the community garden we found in Ashland is um, an opportunity to remove a lot of the stratification that happens in communities, in the sense that mm people that came down there all shared a common love and, and passion for this thing of growing and getting back to the earth and for whatever the reasons. And we found that our membership ranged from folks that were uh, retired folks to people that were uh, uh, owners of bed and breakfast, I'm going to call it the merchant class, people that have uh, restaurants or chefs in restaurants, uh, folks that were, uh, were uh, young and old, self-employed, unemployed, um, uh, 
living in tents, uh, you know, that didn't have a place to grow. Oh. So we kind of closed down this, 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 not closed down, I should say opened up. We dissolved some boundaries yeah. or some stratification. Yeah. And, and out of that common interest, because I can imagine, you know, people from, the, who would never relate socially in some other setting. Absolutely. Or over here comparing notes on the best way to grow their tomatoes or whatever Absolutely. it is. Absolutely. And, 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 and I jokingly referred to uh, several times to fr friends and said, you know, we have everybody from naughty heads to bald, uh, from naughty dreads to bald heads, in, <laughs> you know, in this garden. And, and literally you do, you find all stratas of folks in a community garden. And the benefit is, is these are people that would not give two hoots to each other if they passed each other on the street. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the folks might have even would walk around these people. Um, Instead, as a common feature of, of, you know, of gardening and sustainability and organic health and all those different facets have, have generated this common link. And you'll see these people in, in town and at the recycling center or at a restaurant or at a bank or something and go, hey, you know, how you doing? Yeah, and, that's right. And it's that's developed, great. you know, and that was our key strength in helping uh, the Parks Department acknowledge the benefits of community gardens. Aha. Uh -huh in building community. Absolutely. Social. Right. So are they looking then at the possibility of extending it past your garden? Is that a, a hope in the in a dream in your in your gleam in your eye? G good question. <laughs> good question. Um, we recognized early in the process that our um, our challenge to keeping the community garden that was currently in place was not necessarily the battle of garden on that site but the status of community gardens on city-owned property in Ashland. So when we were getting ramped up in the advocacy campaign to have our garden survive, I recognized with the Parks Commission say, you know, this garden is important, but let's put this discussion aside for a second and let's talk about garden policy, or let's talk about park policy. You have nothing in your policy that accepts community gardens. Uh -huh. And so we actually worked with the park commissioners to put in place a policy on supporting community gardens as a park infrastructure. And that was that was probably very critical. I, was just I saying, would imagine because that gives you the seed for the future. Absolutely. For so, extending this model. Absolutely. So now what the Parks Commission is going to be doing in, in the near future is they're actually going to, they're surveying all the, pro the properties in town that the Parks Department owns. Mm -hmm. And we will be looking at those properties and seeing which properties are conducive to putting community garden plots on. The plots may be, it may be a few garden plots, six or seven. It may be 50. Um, and there's property all over town that is conducive to it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's and, great. And, and the beautiful thing about it is if you take a, a, a square foot of park property, right? let's say you take a baseball diamond or a soccer field or uh, a, you know, a formalized English garden, there's a lot of cost involved into maintaining that piece of property. Uh-huh. Okay. That parks has to support, has yeah, to I find, mean, there's, you know, right? they, 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 they mow it, they weed it, they fertilize it, they do all that kind right, of stuff right. to it. They use a lot of... Chemical um, fertilizer, uh, yeah, chemical pesticides, petrochemical, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And, and Ashland is very sensitive. They, they try very hard to, 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 to not use a lot of stuff just the same. But just the same, there are, there are cost infrastructure and operational costs that's sure, involved there. Sure. And, and we're in the process of demonstrating to them. And there's actually research articles out there that show it, that it's almost like a five to one ratio of, of cost. When you put a community garden into a city park structure, that the cost is decreased by that many times of maintenance. Really? 20% of the of the cost. Well, I'm not sure if it's 20% exactly, or just but a lot lower. It's a lot, lot lower. lower. I mean, depending if you're having rose gardens versus you know a, a vacant sure. field that you sure. mow, but the, it can be as high as a But you have, but you've got volunteers who, by their growing, you know, in their plots, they are the maintainers. Yeah, they they, they are the caretakers of, of that of that little square foot of land. Now I'm sure that the parks there are costs for the parks. Water is the, the city provides water. Absolutely, city and provides probably water. fencing. Fencing. Um, but you said that people pay. How much do people pay to have a plot? Well, you know, it's 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 staggered depending on the size of the plot. Okay. Um, our our typical garden plot is 20 foot by 20 foot, and so that provides uh, to pay the subscription for an annual right to habitat on that okay. land is about fifty dollars a year, and then if. If there's if there's smaller plots, then it's uh, like for instance a twenty by ten or twenty five. Yeah, sure, sure. and we have pl we have garden plots as small as uh, ten by ten uh, so or five by ten. Be the scale that they feel they can manage. Absolutely, and it's you know surprisingly enough, you think well, gee, a you know five by ten foot piece of property is 
I mean, you know, that's, that's not nothing. very big. But you know, if you have somebody who's who's a uh, uh, who's got mobility issues, uh, or that's a lot of that's a lot of land for them. Yeah. Um, and so we're there trying to give access to people as well as you know an opportunity for the able-bodied person to to, to grow. Uh, and from a cost standpoint, you know, let's say if it's a twenty fifty dollars for a twenty by twenty plot. Well, how many? How much do you spend on tomatoes over a season? Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, that's easy to, I mean, I can imagine. Are most of your gardeners using it for growing food or food and flowers or uh, Both, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a wide variety of things uh, uh, in the garden. I mean, mainly, it, it's, it's food. Uh, and since our garden is an organic site, we, we don't use any, any pesticides okay. or petrochemicals. But that's just half the story because when people have a, uh, when you have a diverse population of people coming into a garden site everybody has their own little technique that they bring to the game plan okay all right and a lot of these folks have never been an organic gardener before mm. you know they've been the miracle grow gardener you know okay and and i mean yeah uh, it's, so there's it's a lot a, of new learning here to happen absolutely and it's you know it's a great product if you like you know forcing your plants and using that kind of stuff and i'm not going to go down that path but so part of part of our mission there at the community garden is to help people incrementally make the transition on this continuum from conventional gardening into the organic gardening realm and eventually all the way into being permaculturist. And oh. and it's it doesn't happen overnight. Everybody has different skill sets and different knowledge and different philosophies. Um, Things that you might think of as being an organic practice are can be in essence organic. organic. You know, you can go to the to a, a store and buy stuff off the shelf that has that's labeled natural. Uh, okay. Okay. But you know, the processes still in, invoke a lot of very highly, uh, you know, uh, um, not so natural processes to extract that, yes, that organic yes. compound and transport it probably and transport it absolutely. And so you know, it, it's a continuum. Well, let's get away from the petrochemicals first and. You know, if you want to use an off-the-shelf market brand, okay, well, this is how you determine if it's healthy, safe, and wise to use under this organic gardening principle. And then as people work their way through this continuum of education and, and decrease their dependencies upon, upon um, commercial products, uh, and there are a lot of great commercial products out there. I use a bunch of them myself. But you have to make, it's a continuum of how much work and time and energy you want to put into it. How do people, how, I mean, there must be some kind of training or education that's involved to, to introduce those ideas to mm -hmm. people moving to move from that continuum. Is there anything done? I mean, does like your school system or people do any trainings or education for, for gardeners? We're, we're extremely fortunate in this area. There's all kinds of training and education going on, starting at our own community garden and then going out from there. Um, I would say one of our uh, uh, one of our uh, very helpful institutions is the uh, Master Gardener Association, mm -hmm. which is a nationwide. Yeah, we have them in our community uh, too. They're everywhere, and there's our garden site. There's probably out of the 44 gardens that are there, there are probably uh, oh, I would guess probably a dozen master gardeners that are actually in there. And, and you know, once you're a master gardener, you're always a master gardener, and, and you're always sharing. Uh, your tips and techniques, and this class. So the master gardeners does training. We do training. Um, several of our gardeners uh, do classes specifically dealing with organic and permaculture issues. Okay. Okay. Um, rather than just gardening in general. So we focus on on, on that. so to help people move towards that right. organic model that you're talking about. Yeah. Earlier in June, we did a class on organic garden pest management. Okay. Uh, using Great. the integrated pest management model, but then we kind of cut it off there at the chemical use and say, well, you can use these if you want to go down that path. And then we tell them why it's not the, the, the most beneficial from a health standpoint and environmental standpoint and show them the alternatives. People are amazed. There are so many wonderful tools and techniques that you can keep pests out of your garden or decrease the damage. It's a tolerance issue as well. Uh, sure, and then sure. the park system, the North Mountain Parks has a wonderful curriculum that, of, of gardening and permaculture tools and or the tours, excuse me, and things like that. So you just told me about um, a couple of things that you've done that are interesting in your classes. Your recent class was what, the Night of the Nematodes? Well, that <laughs> <laughs> Night of the Nematodes, that was actually a, more of a social event. 
<laughs> it was a potluck. <laughs> okay. And, and we, we try and It hold... was not a nematode potluck, I hope. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. They, were, they, they weren't on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> First, let's tell us, what's a nematode? A nematode, essentially, well, there's, there's two types of nematodes. There's dozens of nematodes, but essentially nematode's a worm. It's a ground-dwelling worm. Little tiny guys. Uh, tiny microscopic. Tiny. Uh -huh. you, you can't see them with the naked eye. Okay. They're really small. And, and the nematodes that we're very interested in are uh, called uh, predatory nematodes. And uh, the night of the nematodes was we had a bunch of gardeners who were interested in taking a, uh, a being proactive about pest management in the okay. garden. And that's what it was. So we had a potluck event. People brought down food, that, all, all this great, wonderful food from the garden, and, and as well as not from the garden. And, uh, and so it was kind of the activity was we, we ate, we, we partied there in the garden, and then we you know, had night of the nematodes, and we mixed up big you know, bins of uh, trash cans of water with the predatory nematodes and let them loose. But that's one of the things that we brought forth for the community, is a lot of folks had never, ever heard of this right. type of method for pest control. And, and, and so that's part of the education that we're doing in the sustainability elements because you're, you're populating your soil with this stuff. So have you got any, any uh, are there any, is Parks and Recreation working on plans for other parks or is that yet to be seen if they'll be putting more gardens in? Sure, they've actually, uh, while they're looking at our piece of property, which was known as the, the former Vogel property, um, and working on developing that master plan. They were simultaneously developing a master plan for the Scenic Park property, which is uh, a little higher up in the, in the, in the town. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very steep, elevated area. It's, it's, it's not really conducive to, to gardens in general, but they managed to put a community garden site. It's moved around a little bit, uh -huh. but because of our energies, I think, to say, this is important, the population wants this, and they're, they're hearing this, and they're that's, going to, you know, let's... That's exciting. So they put that one in, and like I said, they're doing a tour sometime later in the year, they're going to assess which properties are conducive and, and go from there. So it's a, it's a wonderful progress, a wonderful relationship. I think that that's a great model for using available lands. This time it's an agency that's, that's carrying, that's right. responsible for it. Um, that in time is going to be what we're all going to be needing to do with all those extra pieces of land and right. our rooftops and so on because as the, the, the oil costs are rising, you know, Absolutely. our transportation, you're just not going to want to get your tomatoes from California, even though we're relatively <laughs> well, we're close. we're relatively close, right. Um, but or or Mexico or about, Chile. Or right. Much less that. I mean, we're just, it's, it's going to be too cost prohibitive right. and only the wealthy will be able to enjoy that. Well, one of the also important things, too, is, is that by having a, a municipality behind you, it gives uh, the gardening community a little extra help and leverage because not only are our park commissioners looking at, at um, putting uh, community gardens on park properties, but they're investigating vacant pieces of land and oh. they're, they're working as a as, as, as kind of as the, the go-between and, and as the authority to negotiate possibly with other property owners with putting gardens on properties that are not community gardens. They're, they're not private, owned or business owned. Yeah, right. right. They're not owned by the park system. Right, right. And there's good and there's bad things about that. But one of the big challenges for community gardens across the country is this issue of permanence. Yeah. How long can we be there? And so by having a city municipality or municipality sponsor that initiative is, 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 is a wonderful that and valuable That gives us some, some good leverage, I can see for And a that. longer term yeah. element to yeah. it. Well, we look at you, you mentioned the, earlier the example of the, the, the large farm in south central Los Angeles that's right. been going for something like 13 years. Oh, it's a big one for I mean, huge, huge piece that just got closed. Yeah, it's terrible, it's unfortunate. And that's, that's, that's a demonstration, that's a good example of, of of a, of a well-established garden on private property that, that in the beginning had a good relationship with the landowner. Um, and, and so, and unfortunately, you know, people want to reap the, the benefits of owning that property and that investment, and sometimes they go by the wayside of under the, under the plow or under the blade of, mm -hmm. of the bulldozer, and mm -hmm. that's a very unfortunate thing. Um, I think there's some important lessons to be learned there for citizens all across the country who are interested in doing this. And as much passion as somebody has for a community garden, um, it's you get further by working with your stakeholders than working against in them. In an adversarial way. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so if there's anything, any, any community that's saying, gee, I'd like to put a community garden in, find ways to develop you know, a partnership and a relationship with these people because, you know, if you look at the statistics, everybody likes the garden, whether it's a beautiful garden set like this, not everybody, but you know, a lot of people who do. And, and, and work within their system and their structure. And it takes a little bit of homework. You have to do your homework. That's a very important element. I think that we've got about two minutes okay. left. Have you, I want to make sure any last thoughts that you wanted to cover that we haven't covered. And I remember one, patriotic. Well, there's, this whole thing about wrapping ourselves in the flag, and it's, it, it's it, okay, yeah, it works, um, but you know, community gardening is really a true move of patriotism, and sustainability is a, is, is a patriotic movement. Community gardens have been way back to the days of victory gardens before World War II. We did things to make America strong, and that's one thing. Um, and I wanna point out that if people are interested in working and developing community gardens in their environment, I have them log on to the American Community Garden Association website. That's communitygardens.org. Okay. And and they have all kinds of tools for people that are advocating for community gardens. Oh, good. Very ex excellent website. They helped us immensely. That's a great. It's great to have a resource. It's broader, so that you're you're one example, but there's a whole lot of others and, and tools to doing that. There's, there's there's tools. There's training. There's reference materials. There's conferences. There's teleconferences people can log on for for free and do a teleconference on the telephone on their computer toll free now it's a great resource so what you're saying here is community gardens are as american as apple pie absolutely and if as if america's going to be really a strong country and strength is not just in our in our weapons and, and invading yeah. countries for oil it really is in what we do at the individual moment and sustainability happens in, in avoiding peak oil happens one plot at a time Mm. It's one activity. One plot at a time. That's doable. That's very it? doable. Thank you. This has been wonderful. Thank you for being one community garden at a time in your town. You're welcome. And educating people. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I'm Jenea Donaldson, and you're watching Peak Moment, Community Responses to a Changing Energy Future. Join us next time.